Thank you so much for clicking on today's message from Elm Grove Baptist Church. Here at Elm Grove Baptist, our mission is the Great Commission, sharing the gospel and love of Jesus Christ with not only our surrounding community, but across this world. We're so thankful for the opportunity to present these messages online, and as we progress and move forward in our presentation, we ask that you continue to like and subscribe to these videos, and don't forget to share them with your friends and loved ones. Now, please enjoy today's message from Elm Grove Baptist Church. Took the nails for you and me 
morning's scripture is going to be found in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 12, Jeremiah chapter 12, beginning with verse number 1. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Thou hast planted them, yea, they have taken root. They grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins. But thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me and tried mine heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. How long shall the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither for the wickedness of them that dwell therein? The breasts are consumed and the birds because they said he shall not see our last end. If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? For even thy brethren, and the house of thy father, even they have dealt treacherously with thee. Yea, they have called a multitude after thee. Believe them not. Thou they speak fair words unto thee. I have forsaken mine house, I have left mine heritage, I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the land of her enemies. Mine heritage is unto me as a lion in the forest, it criest out against me, therefore have I hated it. Mine heritage is unto me as a speckled bird, the birds round about are against her. Come ye, assemble all the beasts of the field, come to devour. Many pastors have destroyed mine vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate, and being desolate, it mourneth unto me. The whole land is made desolate, because no man layeth it to heart. The spoilers are come upon all high places through the wilderness. For the sword of the Lord shall devour from the one end of the land, even that the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. They have sown wheat, but shall reap thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but shall not profit. And they shall be ashamed of your revenues because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord against all mine evil neighbors that touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. And it shall come to pass after that I have plucked them out, I will return and have compassion on them and will bring them again, every man to his heritage and every man to his land. And it shall come to pass if they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name, the Lord liveth as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then shall they be built in the midst of my people. But if they will not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, saith the Lord. You may be seated. The last verse I'd like to call your attention to. But if they will not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, saith the Lord. Today is going to be a more difficult sermon than I normally preach. Maybe harder. Maybe down to the point. I've watched our country since I've been, um, oh, I guess, started looking into it about the time I was six or seven years old, about your time when you did it. And I've lived through all the 50s up to this point. I've watched an unbelievable change and not just in automobiles, <laughs> our homes, but in institutions like the school, like the government, like the home. I see massive changes. When I was a kid growing up, we all ate at the table, had prayer, Thank God for the food. We went to school, and if you didn't go to school, the truant officer got you and put you in jail. We went to church on Sunday and listened, or you got to whip him when you got home.
We've always seen the flag honored and loved. We spoke highly of the president regardless if he's a Democrat or Republican. And we cried when somebody close to us died. We watched our country honor God. Now we see our country laughing at God. So I asked you seven questions. I call them seven hell-shaking questions, just to make it blunt. I'm going to talk a little about interrogation. Have you ever been interrogated? My son went into the army. He was a Russian interrogator. I couldn't stand to be around Rodney. He knew everything. He was an interrogator. Once an interrogator, always one. He's still in the army. I want to talk to you a little bit about revelation. By the way, God interrogates you in case you don't know that. He says to Adam, where art thou, Adam? Peter, whom do you say I am? Peter, then there's a word revelation. You might want to think about that. Revelation means to reveal yourself. That's why we have the book of Revelation when Jesus is going to reveal himself back to you again someday. A revelation. Revolution. You know, that's where you're completely changed. We'll talk about that a little bit. Reformation, a work inside out. A revival, something everybody needs. And then the return. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this world. Is he coming? Yes. When? Don't know. Does he leave any signs? Yes. They're all around you. So I begin this by saying this. Are you beyond being preached to? You say, is anybody? <laughs> yeah. The people in Noah's day, I mean, Noah's day was beyond it. They didn't want anything to do with Noah's preaching. He preached to them for 120 years. Seems like that's how long I preached. I have gone home many times and asked a question. Why don't people understand or why can't they be like me? Reminds me of my fair lady. Remember him? Remember my fair lady? Remember Professor Higgins? Why can't a woman be like a man? I said, why can't a person be like me? I mean, I was, grew up poor. I grew up uh, I mean. I grew up nasty and cantankerous. I grew up in, I was in a reform for a home for children. I mean, I grew up in jail. I mean, I was in jail all the time. Why can't people be like me? get saved and decide to go to church every time the doors open. I wondered about that. My kids, uh, they got tired of hearing me say, now I had four boys. Now there's none of them here today, so I can say I had four of the ugliest boys you ever did see in your life. My son Johnny was so ugly that when he got ready to get on the bus to go to kindergarten. My wife and I waited for him while he got on the bus. And as soon as he got on that bus, my wife and I moved. <laughs> but he found us. Four boys. They would ask me some of the most unique questions. By the way, I never was friends with my boys. You hear me? My boys and I were never friends. I was his father. Amen. We're friends now. My friend, my boys love me. They call me nearly every day. We love each other. I think it's a dangerous thing to be a friend to your son. 
You're their father. How many of you have had a friend, you got an argument and you weren't friends any longer? That's why you don't make your kids your friends. Because when you get into a scolding session or a disciplining session or a time when you have to tell them something or give them a whipping, they'll say, well, dad did it. He's supposed to. But I ask you this question. Are you beyond the point of preaching? My kids would always say, oh, I know, I know, dad. Hey, dad, can I wear my hair a little long? No. How come, Dad? My friends do. I didn't. That's why you're not. That was the only answer I ever give them. Dad, can I have a piercing in my ear? No. How come? I didn't. Dad, can I stay home today? I don't feel real good. No. How come? I didn't. They got tired of hearing that. They got tired of hearing it. Dad, can I stay out late? No. How come? I didn't. Now, you say, well, that was, you was mean to your kids. Yeah. Yeah. I'll show you something. See this? What is this? It's a hymn book. Where'd my boys sit? Front row. If I saw my boys talking while I was preaching, there's people in this church saw me do it. Why'd you do that? Why were there? Why are they there? To listen or talk? It was just because I was just a mean guy. But I wanted them to go to church and learn something. By the way, they still go to church. All four of them go to church. Every Sunday. One of them comes here. Sits back there. 54 years old. 54 years, 54 years ago, the 10th of this month, he was born into this world. Now, he's not here today, so I'm talking about him. But there's a question I want to ask you, seven of them. I want you to answer me the question I asked you to yourself. Especially you young folk. Teenagers. You know what a teenager is? Teenager is half kid, half adult. Most of the time they don't know which half they are. I always said the best years of my life could have been if I didn't have a teenager. One guy came by one time, my house knocked on my door, was selling encyclopedias. So I like to, I, look, you needed to get one of these. I said, I don't need a encyclopedia. I said, I got a teenager. Why should I pay money for something I already got that knows everything? You ever wonder about that? Now, I had four teenagers at the same time. And that was really an educational time in my life. I did not have to have a Bible a dictionary. I had a teenager. I didn't even have to have a Bible. I had a teenager. They knew it all. Just ask them. But they found out they didn't know it all real fast. They got married. But are you we beyond the point of preaching? Hell, fire, and damnation preaching. Old time preaching where they just nailed you to the wall. 
Are we beyond that? Is anybody? Noah was. Noah's day, in Noah's day, the people could not listen to Noah because they were beyond preaching. They were beyond listening to the preacher. When the flood came, God saved Noah, his wife, his three sons, his three sons' wives. That was it, eight. The rest of them was screaming and hollering and trying to get in the ark, but it was too late because they were beyond preaching. You couldn't tell them nothing. You couldn't tell them what was sin. You couldn't tell them what was right. You couldn't tell them what was wrong. You couldn't tell them nothing. And they laughed at the preacher until the floods came and destroyed them. Amen. Sodom and Gomorrah, the people that lived during Sodom and Gomorrah was beyond preaching. You couldn't tell them nothing. Just like today, we are living in Sodom and Gomorrah. You guys know what sodomy is? Don't have to explain it to you. They named a city after it. Sodom and Gomorrah. There's a law in the land that you cannot commit a sodomy. They have banned that law. You couldn't tell them it was wrong like you can't tell them it's wrong today. It was sin. Filth. But now you're being educated on it. Television's educating. Hollywood's educating you. Everybody's schools are educating you. That it's right and it's not wrong, they say. It's, they say, in other words, God's wrong. They are beyond the preaching. Are we there? We are beyond the point of preaching. We tell people to go to church. I ain't going to go to church because I don't want to. You'll wish you did. You'd wish you'd listened. You'd wish, you, let me tell you what. I used to hear my people that, were, that trained me, my coaches basically. My coaches would say, you'll wish you did. Yeah. I remember that. I have heard that term before. You wish you did. I got sick and tired of hearing that word. Now I know exactly what he meant. My four sons, I tell this story about all the time. I might never forget my son Dwayne. The day he got his, go get his driver's lesson. I said, you read that book, son? Hey, you read your book. Yeah, got it read that. Ready to take that license? Yep, yep, ready to go get my license. Read that book, son? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, you read that book good? Yeah, I read that book good. Flunk the test. Didn't read the book. Uh, you wished you did. Guess what? Your friends are driving. You're not. You know why? Because you failed. I said to my Rodney. I said, Rodney. Uh, Rodney is a smart boy. You have to understand Rodney speaks three languages. I said, Dad, it's my day. So go get my driver's license. Smart boy. I said, read that book? Yep, read that book. Flunk the test. Why did, he flunk that, why did he flunk that test? He didn't read the book. Thought he didn't have to read the book. It's like people today don't think you have to read the book. The Bible. I said, what happened, Rodney? I, uh, then he tried to use a, this excuse. This is the best excuse I have ever heard. That was the day the challenger exploded. He said, but Dad, I was so shook up about the challenger. I couldn't think. You wish you did. While your friends are driving, you're not. But then it was time for David to take it. Old smiling David. I said, read the book. Got the book down, Dad. Read that book clear. Got her down. You gonna be the first to pass that thing? Huh? You gonna be the first one? How are you gonna be the first one? I'm ready, Dad. Flunk the test. 
Now he passed the written, he flunked the driving. There was something in the street, so he swerved and nothing to miss it. Boop, automatic failure. Been better off hit that rock. Then came John, number four. We pumped John, the whole church pumped John. The whole church pumped John. Man, just before he gets that test, we all get ready. Go, John, go, John, go, John, go. Go, John, go, John, go, John, go. Oh, for you, John, we're for you, John. Go, John, go, John, go, John. Did you read that book, John? Yeah, I read it, I'm ready. Go, John, go, John, go. Oh, you're ready. Go, John, go, John. Yeah. Flunk the test. <laughs> Didn't read the book. You know why people are flunking all over this world today? Haven't read the book. You only read what you believe. So if you're not reading it, you're not what? You're not believing it. So people are beyond the point of preaching. You can't tell somebody that it's wrong. I told a guy one time it's wrong to have long hair. He said, show me the Bible. I did. He still didn't believe it. The Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Now I either got short hair or no hair. One of the, You look at me in two different directions. You can see me two ways. But it says it in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 11 is still in the book. I know it is there because I just took a look. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. I didn't say that. The Bible did. Bible's supposed to look like a hey, man's supposed to look like a man. Well, I think, I think long hair on guys are cute. I don't care if you think it's cute or not. I don't think I, I, I didn't care if I thought it was cute or not. The Bible says it's a shame. I didn't say that. Well, Jesus had long hair. How do you know? Did you take that picture? The first person ever drew a picture of Jesus with long hair was homosexual. He drew him how he seen him. I'm sure this sermon's going to go down big on YouTube. <laughs> Get ready, folks. It's worse. Are you beyond the point of intercession? You see, God did not destroy the whole world and everybody that was in it on the flood, did he? There was some he interceded for. Amen. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and his three sons' wives. Eight. So eight did not die in that flood. Because God made intercession. The question is that when the time comes and judgment falls, where are you going to stand? With God are against him. By the way, the whole world's against God now. I mean, there's, there's Christians out there. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, you just look at the governments of the world. Anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-Bible. You see, when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, there was some that was saved. Amen. Lot. Some of Lot's children. Now, Lot's wife wasn't uh, saved. She had a love for the world, like people today have. Can't wait to get to the bars. Can't wait to party. Can't, get, can't wait to go see a dirty movie. Can't wait. And it bothered her so bad that when God said, don't even look back, she did. It cost her. Because God is God. And he means business. Are you beyond a point of repentance? Does the altar, when I give an altar call, does an altar call scare you to death? It does if you got a bunch of guilt in you. You see, the altar is your friend. 
The altar is a place you come and get close to God. They made songs about the altar. You can read in your Bible all about the altars. It's a place where you and God meet up. You say, I can do that in my chair. You can. But God does not say, come to the pew. He says, come to the altar. It's the altar. Now, he wants you in church and he wants you to listen. But there's people in this room here today that has been so long since you've been to an altar, you're scared to death of it. People don't think I'm bad. <laughs> Join the crowd. I'll be right down there with you. See, I'm just a sinner. Saved by grace. I need the altar. Amen. Have you ever, is there something that you've been without that you're not used to being without and when you're without it, you panic? For instance, you take a man that smoked cigarettes. I watched them climb the walls when they couldn't smoke. When I was in the military, they took the cigarettes away from them. I watched guys crawl up the walls. I watched them scream, Oh, I gotta have it! I gotta have it! You know what I gotta have? The altar. I have to have it. I belong at the altar. That's where I meet with my God who made me, who loved me, who sent his son to die for me, who gave everything to me, everything that I have. I love the altar. Now, I don't think you need to come to be coming. I think you need to come to be praying. I think you need to come to be getting rid of something in your life. I think you need to come and talk to God about it. I need, if you have some need in your life, if there's somebody dear to you that's, I don't, there's not a better place to pray for them at the altar. Amen. We're beyond repentance. Are we, are, we, are we beyond that? Judas was. Judas. He was a disciple. Went to hell. You know why? Beyond repentance. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you the toughest question you've heard today. Listen to this question. Could have Judas repented? But he was beyond repentance. Are you? Is that why the altar is cold to you? Is that why you're afraid of it? You see, repentance. See, this is the Lord's day, you guys. Forget thinking it's yours. This is the Lord's day. You come to do business with God. You come to church to do business with him. You need to listen to him. You need to do business with him. People that go to the wailing will all go to pray. People come to church to listen, to hear the word of God, and then repent. You've been down and out. You haven't been living right. You've not been doing right. You haven't been serving God like you should. You haven't been praying. You haven't been reading your Bible. Where is the best place to get hold of God? The altar. I'll see you there. I've caught myself many times not praying like I should. I have caught myself multitudes of times not reading my Bible like I should. Right. Where's the best place to find God? At the altar. Are you beyond repentance? The word repentance means to have a change of mind. That's what repentance means. I have changed my mind about this. I got saved in 1963. Before that, every Friday night for years, two years, three years, every Friday night or Saturday night or whenever I could night, my friend George Esler and I would get in his car and we'd go steal hubcaps. That's true. Hey, the day I met Debbie had over $400 worth of baby moons and baby moons in my back. Remember baby moons? Yeah. Had, them in my, had them in the trunk. I stole them. Then there came the day When I met God at the altar, never stole another hope yet. You know why? Had a change of mind. Amen. I repented, changed my mind. 
That's what repentance is. You have a change of mind, go the other way. Repentance. Are you beyond that? Pharaoh was. Let my people go. Get out of here. No, you can't. Let my people go. Then go ahead and get out of here. No, you can't. He kept changing his mind. Could have Pharaoh been saved? Had there been Pharaoh saved? Yeah. Could he have been saved? But he's beyond repentance. Are you? Are you beyond repentance? Does the altar scare you to death? Are you afraid to come to the altar? If you come to the altar, has your pride got you down? Are you afraid to hit the old altar? You know, our country, you tell me why not. Why isn't revival taking place in our country? People are afraid of the altar. People are afraid to repent. People are afraid of the Bible. People are afraid of being called a goody two-shoes. A religious Joe. A holy Joe. A religious quack. A religious nut. Your pride's got you down. Are you beyond repentance? Are you beyond revival? Are you just living the old hum religious life? Well, I'm a Christian, I love God, but you know what? I'm not gonna get too fired up about it. Is that, how come? America's going to hell in a handbasket. Think about your children. What are they gonna go through? Grandchildren. I'll get you somewhere. Great grandchildren. Do you care? Does churches have revivals anymore? We're gonna have a preacher here next Sunday. Oh my goodness, watch out. We're going to have a six foot five inch former tackle on a football team. Boom, boom. You'll hear him. You, you don't want to miss him. He'll get you. Father's Day. And he's going to be preaching to the daddies. Oh man, I ain't coming next week. Man, my wife's going to expect me to be religious. Oh. The shame of it all. You beyond revival. God has, has no recipe for revival other than 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Come to God. Get on your knees and repent. Are you beyond the point of deliverance? I've had people say, I can't get help. I, spent, I want to tell you what I wish I could do. I, I, I can't do this. Nobody can do this. I, I, there's been every preacher I know want to do this, but here's what I wish I could do. I wish I could hang you over hell for 10 seconds and let you see how it is and know that you're going to spend eternity without repentance. Right. Everybody I know would repent. Because there's nobody man enough to handle that, but they think right now they can because the devil's got you deceived. You're beyond revival. If I call for a revival meeting, I'd have about one-fourth of the church every night here. Because the rest of you don't need revival. You think. America needs revival. Do you believe that? I don't know where we're going to go. With this president, I got no clue. I didn't have much of a clue with the last one. Just want to make sure you know that I'm not neither either one of those. And now I supported the other one. I'll tell you why. You say it's because of himself? No, because of his love for America and for the church and for God's people and for Israel. Amen. Look what they're doing to Israel now, ladies and gentlemen. Under this administration, you honor Israel, God will honor you, America. Amen. But if you don't believe the Bible and you don't teach the Bible and you don't read the Bible and you don't know the Bible and you don't listen to the Bible, you're not going to do anything the Bible tells you to do. Right. You know why? Because they're beyond it. The question is, are you beyond revival?
Are you been on deliverance? You think our homes can be saved? Question, do you think your schools can be saved? Do you think our churches can be saved? Talk to me. You think our schools can be saved? Now, I want you to know, you start saving them and ain't nobody going to like it. You start telling kids what they got to do and what they can't do and better they're not going to like it no more than they're not like it now. There will be a fight on your hand. Do you think a church, look, you tell the churches, churches start preaching the old time religion. Start giving an invitation. Start having revival meetings. Even the people in the church, I'm not going, I'm too old. I mean, Moses was 80 when he took the children out of Israel. I mean, out of Egypt, into the promised land. He was 80. Are you beyond deliverance? Sons and daughters, are you beyond, are you beyond deliverance? What if I came up with a dress code in church where you ought to come to church looking your best? Would you think there would be anything wrong with that? You can't go see the President of the United States even if he's a Democrat unless you're in a suit and tie on. Hey, you, <clears throat> when I went and applied for a job, I had a suit and tie on. You ask a kid to come, you come to church, man, can I wear short shorts? No. You need to wear a dress, so they come in a miniskirt. You say, why are you, why are you so mean? I'm just telling you where our country's at. Isn't that true? Amen. Are you beyond deliverance? They told Daniel he could not pray to any other but to the people of his day. He said, oh, fooey. He goes up there, opens the window so everybody can see him pray and starts praying to his God. He did what he knew was right. Jeremiah, hey, look, those three children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what they do? They say, I'm not going to bow down to that. You do and we'll throw you in the fire. I'll throw me. Would you take a stand today? Are we beyond that? Are we beyond forgiveness? Do you have a hard time forgiving people? Have you got, are you got odds at somebody now, right now? Are you mad at somebody you don't talk to them? You don't want to be around them? I had a Christian tell me one time, she said, I hate that person. I said, that person's a Christian. I hate her anyway. I said, the Bible says you cannot hate another person if they're a Christian, if you're one. The Bible said we know we have passed from death into life because we love the brother, not hate him. I've forgiven my dad. He told me that he hated every inch of ground that I walked on, but I've forgiven him. He gave my mother pills and to take this so she so I would be aborted. Get rid of that baby. Get rid of that baby. But I've forgiven him. I led him to Christ. Amen. I preached his funeral. Are you beyond forgiveness? Most people are today. One last thing. Are you beyond the point of judgment? May I just tell you right now, the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Did you hear me? Yes. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Madeline Murray O'Harris. Every wicked, vile person, every person that's ever been born, knee will bow, tongue shall confess that Christ Jesus is Lord. A guy tell me one time, I'm not worried about judgment. He's dead now. I wonder if he's worried about it. What do you think about that? 
You see, notice it says in verse 17 of our text today, but if they will not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, saith the Lord. Have we turned our back on God? Have we kicked God out of our schools? Have we started killing babies to the, most, to the max? Have we? Have we? Huh? Have, have, have we got women? Hey, we got, we got laws now. It says, okay, for a man to become a woman. Men want to become women. Women want to become men. Mar men want to marry men. Women want to marry women. They want to change their sex. Have we gone against God? Have we spit in the face of our Heavenly Father? Have we said, God, we don't need you? Have we said that in our country? Yes. Payday someday. It's coming. Only way out. Only hope we have. Repentance. The best place to repent is at the altar. Oh, dear God. Come down here and pray for yourself to start it off with. Then go to everybody you know and say, you need to get yourself right with God. Our country's going to hell in a handbasket. And get them to, and see what I see every week of my life. Don't come preaching to me, preacher. I don't need no preaching. Everybody needs preaching. It's just they don't want preaching. But I'll tell you something else. Beyond all that, they don't want they don't want hell. Not one minute. Not one second. Amen. Not one tenth of a second. But Satan's laughing today. Because they know. He knows. They're not going to get a second. They're not going to get a minute. They're going to get an eternity. In suffering. God don't want it. See that cross up there? Jesus died on it. So you all could go to heaven, walk streets of gold, kick up gold dust, and spend eternity in a utopia, a blissful heaven. Have we gone beyond that? Have we turned our back on the only person that could give us that? Father, thank you for the day. Bless the message to the hearts of the people. And may I say that again, Lord, so they can hear, not you. Dear Lord, bless this message to the hearts of the people. Forgive us of our sins. We have many. Help us to have a full altar today. If there's someone here today that's not saved, the first thing that should be on their mind is whether or not they go to heaven because they certainly don't want to go to hell. The first thing. If they come to this altar, the first thing you should say is, Preacher, I need to make sure I'm going to heaven. I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. Dear God, speak. Speak to the hearts of the people. I beg you. In the name of Jesus, amen.